Abby Myers, Northtown Neighborhood News Magazine, a presentation of Sonny Hirsch and myself. Hey, Marty, how's it going? Thank you so much. We appreciate. Uh, dial us up on the World Wide Web at ntnm.org, where over 50,000 shows have been watched on YouTube. You'll find all the links to them. Uh, we're really big on community policing, real big on community policing. Caps24.org. Sonny Hirsch, in his spare time, our entire technical crew, is the chairman of the District Advisory Committee of the 24th District, which co is composed of West Rogers Park, Rogers Park, part of Edgewater. Um, you can look on his website for all the different meetings for each and every single beat within the neighborhood. And if you live outside the neighborhood, dial 311 and you'll get your local community policing meetings. Um, you know, our second segment today is going to be Liz Vitale, the president, uh, I'm the executive director of the West Rogers Park Community Council. And speaking of community policing, the person who, who, was, a, is a, who was totally instrumental in helping community policing be developed in the 24th district and who picked those great, you know, uh, defenders of truth, justice, and the American way, Stephen <laughs> Hank, to, to head it up originally, um, the former community policing sergeant of the 24th district, the former commander of the 24th district, and now the Deputy Chief of Patrol for Area 3, Deputy Chief Bruce Ratner. How are you? Avi, always a pleasure to be here. Thank My pleasure. You. And of course, you're very much a neighborhood guy. Yeah, yeah. I was born and raised in this neighborhood. I lived in this neighborhood for a long time. And, uh, you know, I currently live in Edgewater. Uh, but I'm still here. I'm still up north. So. You know. And you shot, We see, everybody sees you at the Jewel on Howard. Uh, yeah, that's where I shot. That's, you know. I mean, I, I wasn't those, one of those people that wanted their wall up there. So, but, you know. But, it, but it's, uh, yeah, yeah, I've always been a far north sider, so, you know, it's a great community to live in. Yeah. You know, a lot of people don't understand what things like an Area 3 is or what a deputy chief of patrol is, so. Well, without really getting into the whole structure of the police department, uh, the city is divided basically into to six areas, uh, and uh, areas one through five, then what we call the Central Control Group, which is the 1st and 18th District, which is basically the downtown area. Yeah. It's a separate area because of everything that goes on down here. Down there, I should say, uh, Area 3 is comprised of four districts, the, the 19th, the 20th, the 23rd, and the 24th districts. So basically, I have overall responsibility for everything north of Fullerton Avenue to the city limits on the north and from the Lake Street to basically Kedzie on the west. That's uh, approximately 13 to 1,400 police officers plus supervisors and uh, um, the commanders of each district uh, report directly to me, and I report now to a chief who then reports to a deputy superintendent. So uh, um, being a deputy chief, it's, it's, it's a big job. Your, your scope is much bigger, uh, but we've got four really outstanding commanders in Area 3, and that makes my job uh, just a lot easier. And, of course, we have a new commander of the 24th District. Yes, you do. Uh, Dave Sopchek took over the 24th District. Uh, Dave and I have known each other a long time. We made captain together uh, back in 2004. Uh, Dave was assigned down to the Deployment Operations Center, the DOC, as we call it, uh, for several years. Uh, he's a very bright, energetic, hard-working guy. Uh, he was always a great street policeman. Dave has a lot of experience in, 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 uh, in vice issues, uh, licensing, uh, uh, tavern licenses, things like that. As a matter of fact, he actually wrote a manual for the police department wow. on licensing. And although we don't have a tremendous amount of licensing issues up here, uh, you know, with, the, with especially further east where there are more uh, uh, bars and liquor establishments, um, you know, it's something that we're always vigil, uh, vigilant about. Uh, so Dave will help us a great deal in that sense. Uh, Steve Kaloris, who was here since uh, uh, March of 2008, uh, went back to the dock. He's actually the guy that... Uh, they switched uh, jobs, basically. They switched jobs. But Steve was the guy that actually created the Deployment Operations Center uh, uh, back in around 2005, and it was the first commander of the uh, Deployment Operations Center. So uh, Steve is a very intelligent, uh, very hard-working guy as well. As you know, he's been here since March. Uh, and uh, he's a very uh, intelligence-driven um, executive, police executive. Uh, he sees, you know, the value in, in, in intelligence and gathering intelligence and uh, uh, basically uh, finding out where we think the crime is going to occur, the, the violent crime, the shootings, the gang conflicts before they occur so we can deploy people there, you know. And Steve will really serve the department well back in that role. 
Well, we wish him luck, and I very much enjoyed uh, his tenure here. Yeah, yeah. And I guess I got to get set, used to a whole new set of people. <laughs> well, Steve, and Steve actually was a neighborhood guy, too. Steve grew up in the neighborhood, you know, and I worked with Steve when he was a sergeant in 24, and he was always a uh, just a great street policeman, uh, as Dave Subcheck was. So, like I say, you know, uh, while, while, you know, you see people change and things like that, uh, as a deputy chief, you always keep your fingers crossed and hope you'll get the right person for the job, and... and I think uh, Superintendent Weiss uh, really chose wisely when he put Steve back in the Deployment Operations Center and put Dave Subcheck up here. So uh, it's a good mix, and Dave is going to do a great job up here. I know a lot of people in the Community Relations um, Office of the 24th District uh, have been telling me that, he's, it, that Subcheck is a very much a neighborhood guy and very sure. straightforward. And Sure. They were actually comparing him to Dave Boggs. Yeah, yeah, he's light, like a lot like Dave. You know, again, he's he's, he's very community minded. Uh, uh, he's very, very bright, uh, and you know, another guy who will give you twenty five hours a day. I mean, that's just Dave. You know, uh, he lives not too far from here, so he'll have a little less of a drive than going to Thirty Fifth Street. Uh, but Dave's always been a neighborhood guy, and uh, Dave's always understood the needs of the community. Uh, he's always been a tremendous communicator, you know, and uh, again, uh, he's well liked by the people that worked for him and with him. So, uh, you know, we, we did really well getting Dave up here. Now, how involved are you still with community policing? Well, very involved. I think, uh, you know, as you know, Avi, uh, we recently uh, changed the way we deliver community policing in terms of, of the beat meetings, in terms of our structure uh, prior, and again, without going to a lengthy explanation, um, uh, we staffed a new order, the old order on community policing, our police department policy on community policing uh, was actually uh, developed in 1996, so it was getting a little old, and uh, uh, the superintendent had tasked uh, Chief Lynette Helm with coming up with a new order, a new structure, and actually it was done really well because they brought people in from the street who had actually been involved in community policing for a number of years to develop the new policy rather than just everyone down at headquarters developing the policy for us out here in the field. They brought in a lot of CAPS lieutenants. They brought in patrol officers. Uh, they brought in, uh, I was on part of the committee. Uh, so people had been involved when they actually developed the new structure. Uh, the key changes in the new structure is uh, only officers working the afternoon shift that are currently working will be going to the meetings uh, rather than the officers that work days and work the midnight shift. Uh, but along with that, we also uh, eliminated the position of the beat team leader. As you know, we had sergeants on each beat that were the beat team leader. Uh, we have now a third watcher, an afternoon um, sergeant, who in the 24th District is John Delgado, just an outstanding sergeant. He's a good guy, and I also want to say hi to Sean Mellinger, who was my previous uh, Oh, sergeant. okay. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, Sean, and Sean's still out there. Yeah. Uh, but John will be attending every CAPS meeting, uh, and when he's not there, if he's on vacation or something like that, another sergeant, we have an alternate sergeant, uh, John's responsible for, for keeping the commander informed of all conditions. He's also responsible for keeping the officers on the other two shifts that aren't at those meetings responsible uh, for, for problems that they may have on their shifts and uh, for solving those problems. I mean, that's the bottom line with community policing. It's identifying problems, putting together a strategy, working with city services, working with community people, and then solving the problem. Uh, the key element of this, of course, is if a problem is brought up at a meeting, uh, we work on that problem during the month and hopefully have a resolution by the next meeting. Uh, too often in some community policing uh, meetings that I've been to all over the city, people will raise issues and then the next meeting the issue isn't brought up or, or you know, people are frustrated. I think this is a much cleaner line of communication. It makes one person basically responsible for being the quarterback, if you will, and making sure tasks are delegated not only to police officers but to citizens as well and uh, uh, dealing with city services and then coming together and solving a problem. Uh, the other significant change is the area, the CAPS lieutenant. Uh, each district had a CAPS lieutenant who was basically responsible for uh, uh, putting together our district plans, which we have, our B plans, so on and so forth, and kind of monitoring the CAPS process. Uh, I'll now have 
an area caps lieutenant working out of the area rather than all districts having a caps lieutenant. Uh, and basically what that means is uh, the caps lieutenant for the area will have a much broader view of, of, of all the districts within the area, all four districts in my area of responsibility. Uh, and we'll work with the CAPS sergeants, we'll work with the district commanders in ensuring that their district plans are on track and that the problems are being solved. So uh, that was the other significant change, you know. And Can we say the name of the person? Well, right now he hasn't been assigned okay, yet, so, so, we're, we're, so, we're, so we yeah, right. Yeah, you know, okay. We're waiting for that lieutenant to be That's assigned, uh, uh, you know. Uh, but be that as it may, you know, uh, uh, I, I think every deputy chief who selects a CAPS lieutenant will pick a really first-rate CAPS lieutenant, you know, uh, because, you know, it's an important job. It really is. It's an important assignment, uh, uh, and we're going to keep that CAPS lieutenant busy. So, uh, um, you know, whoever we pick, it, it had better be someone willing to give us the time. I don't know too many people um, who, who basically have, uh, you know, been in, in that level of the police department who don't, have to, who don't usually work their heads off. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's kind of like, you know, we look at all these big corporate executives that, you know, are making six, seven figures and stuff like that. And, you know, how, but most of those guys, you know, work 100 hours a week and, and things like that. And I know a lot of the people down at 35th Street, the top executives of the police department, you know, uh, you know, uh, 14, 15 hours are short days for them. So you know. Now, uh, of course, some of the some of the changes you talked about were, were budgetary in, in in part. Some of the, some like of them not were, getting the ex other officers. Correct. Correct. Because the city is going through a budget crunch. But but well, just out of curiosity, because this is something I really don't know. I would assume that people that are officers are considered like executives and don't get overtime. Well, uh, at certain levels of the police department, like at my level, I don't get overtime. You know, I. Yeah. Uh, uh, but, you know, I always say when, when uh, you know, Phil Klein actually promoted me to commander back in 2005, all I had to say was no. So, you yeah. know, so, <laughs> you know, to, to get to this rank is, is something, it's a privilege, it's an honor, and, and you know, you have to be willing to, to put in the time. And I think if you're uh, serious about this profession, and, and to me it's all about the patrol officers, you know, uh, and I think we've discussed this before, they almost become like your children. You know, you, you're with them every day. Uh, you know, you should know their, their wives' names, their husbands' names, their kids' names. Uh, uh, a lot of them, I mean, because we recruit from the human race, and I've said that before. <laughs> You know, yeah, but uh, you know it's good stuff, and you're not on the show every week, so don't feel free. Well, you know, I, I mean, you know, we're like everyone else. I mean, we we yeah. have homes, we have mortgages, we have bills, expenses. Uh, and like everyone else, some police officers get into trouble. Some of them have, you know, health issues, have families with health issues, uh, like everyone else does. And you have to take care of these people because they're in a very, very responsible position. I mean, we give them a car, we give them uh, a radio, and we give them a gun, you know, and we send them out there. And uh, I think every police executive, if you want to call it, or a boss as we call it, you know, you're always concerned that, that phone call comes at 3 in the morning that one of your officers has been seriously hurt or injured in a car accident and a shooting or something like that. And you just pray these officers after their tour of duty come home safely. I mean, that's what it's all about. And that's what it should be all about for any police executive. You know, it's a, it's a terrible burden sometimes sending them out every night. And we don't talk about it consciously, the, the risk elements that are there. But be that as it may, you know, they're always there. So that's our number one, our number one goal is to make sure our officers get home safely at the end of their tour of duty. And that's something a lot of people don't think mm -hmm. about because it is an extremely dangerous job. It is. And, we, and like I say, we don't think about it. I mean, we don't go around because you, you can't be, you know, fear is a good thing. Fear keeps you on edge. You know, anyone who says they haven't been scared either aren't alive or they're lying to you, you know. There's been a lot of times I've been scared out there. But, you know, you're training uh, and your resolve gets you through those things. And, and like I say, you know, we train our officers and we're continually training our officers. And our hope is that their training will kick in and, and keep them alive. And hopefully, and thank God, it, you know, unfortunately, I do actually remember there have been times that, you, you know, you know better than me. That, that officers from this area have uh, run into problems. They have. I mean, I can go back to 1996, my good friend Jimmy Mullen. Yeah. I mean, Jimmy Mullen didn't know that day that he went to work that he would never walk again or never be able to hold his own child. And, and I just saw Jimmy recently in an event, and, and he's doing terrific. 
Uh, you know, his wife Athena is a detective on our job, and Athena and I worked together back in neighborhood yeah, relations. Yeah, she was in your rights. Yeah, yeah. she worked together. Just terrific, terrific people. Uh, but one never knows when they walk out that door if they'll be coming back. And, of course, that goes for anybody. I mean, God forbid you're hit by a car or something happens, you know. Uh, but there's a little added risk with being a police officer. Oh, yeah. You know. Yeah, and you, you, not only that, but you never know who that person... Uh... No, you never do, <laughs> and, and, and there's no, unfortunately, there's no, there's no rhyme or reason for some of the things that happen out there. So, you know, we always have to be vigilant, and we have to treat every assignment seriously, you know. Uh, sometimes uh, it becomes commonplace to go to domestic disturbance or a bank alarm or something because 98% of them are false, you know. Uh, but we train our officers to always be vigilant because it could be the 2% when it's real. Uh, and, and, you know, if you let your guard down, even for a minute, that's when you get into trouble. And now, of course, it's got to be especially hard because of all the budget cuts throughout the city and the bad economy and all that. Well, it, it, it's a challenge for everybody. It's not just for the, for the police department. It's for all city uh, agencies, and it's for everybody in the United States. It's, it's a challenge, you know. So, you know, we've always been asked to do, you know, more with less, and the superintendent has challenged all of us to do more with less. So, you know, I don't cry about a lack of manpower, a lack of, of vehicles or things like that. You know, I accept them for that's the way it is. I know if the mayor had the money, he'd give us more stuff, and they just don't have it. Uh, so, you know, what we tell our officers is, number one, be safe out there uh, because it's you we're concerned about, but also try and bring that car back in one piece, you know, <laughs> because there aren't a lot out there, you know, and, and the equipment we have, we just have to make sure that it's not abused or anything like that because, you know, right now, you know, we don't see getting any new equipment, you know. Uh, hopefully things, will get some new revenue sources and things like that. You know, I trust the city to bring in some more dollars and, and things will get better. But right now we all, not only in our professional lives and our personal lives, have to be just a little more judicious about how and where we spend our dollars. Yeah, I've got to, one thing I will say, and, and I don't want to... You know what? I'm not going to, because I don't want to get political and released. This is the police okay. department, and police right. department is above politics. Neither do I, right? <laughs> so, uh, now, the, um, is it, uh, technologically, though, I mean, there's been, there have been a lot of advances. I mean, the, the way people can track crimes themselves uh, within a couple it's, of weeks. It's, it's unbelievable what's been done. I mean, I came on the police department in 1972, and, uh, you know, um, I wasn't raised in a computer generation. Uh, today, most of the kids coming on the job, uh, most of the officers are very computer savvy. Uh, but the technology we have is, is probably the best in the country. Uh, uh, we have a, a, a brilliant uh, commander, John Lewin, uh, who is head of our information services. And, uh, and John used to be a, a recruit in the 24th District, and uh, just a brilliant kid. Um, with our clear system, our eye clear system, uh, our ability to, to track crime, to map crime. Uh, any police officer can come in and sit down on a computer in the station there and just map out everything on his own beat. He can see where everything happened. Uh, he can project where crime may happen. Uh, he can bring up suspects. Uh, he can bring up histories of, of places that, that he's been to several times, you know. Uh, a lot of people listen to our radios, and you'll hear one of the officers say, is there a history at this location, you know, 2,700 on, on Pratt. And they can literally bring up the history of the number of calls there, you know, which is good for a police officer to know if he's going into something before he gets there. Uh, maybe there was a man with a gun call there, or maybe there's been several violent domestic disturbances there. Uh, in that way, we can have extra people go over there and help that officer out. So the technology is just so advanced uh, now. Uh, and, and, you know, I always kind of go back to the story of like, 1994, 1995, when we really started getting into the technology. And uh, Tom Byrne was the commander of the 24th District. And there was an old-time police officer named Ray Blah, who was uh -huh. a good friend of mine. If you remember uh -huh. Ray, he was the beat officer on uh, uh, 2412, which is this beat yeah. here. And... Uh, uh, I was talking to Tom Byrne in his office, and you can see out to where one of the computer stations was. And here's Ray Blah, who at that time was like 60 years old. Yeah, we got to wrap this up, so keep Yeah, going. yeah, but, you know, he's sitting there with his half glasses on the computer bringing stuff up. And I remember I said to Tom Byrne, that's a victory. When you can get an old-timer to get into the technology, that's a victory. So 
and today our kids are using it, so it's great. I think it's terrific, and I want to thank you very much. Uh, Deputy Chief Bruce Ratner, Deputy Chief of Patrol in Area 3, thank you so much. Thank you, Abby. I want to I thank my it. entire technical crew, Sonny Hirsch. Um, stay tuned next week. Uh, Elizabeth Tom, next, we're really out of time. I thank you so much for letting people know what's doing. My pleasure.